why don't you put your hands together? All right. I'm so thankful today that we get to hear the word delivered by my great friend, Pastor Jonathan Masirian, lead pastor of Southbrook Church in Franklin, Wisconsin. Why don't we give him a thunderous applause as he comes at this time? Hey, we should be thanking our band this morning for leading us in worship. So let's thank you. Absolutely love it. Thank you. Love it. Thank you. The singers. Well, good morning, my friends. I have more friends than that. Man, good. Good morning, my friends. There you go. My name is Jonathan, and I'm one of the pastors at Southbrook Church down in Franklin. And I'm so thankful to be here. It really is an honor. It's my, it's my privilege to be able to be here with you opening God's word and serving uh, Pastor Brian, serving you this morning. And uh, just real quick, my wife, uh, I'm married to my wife, Lynn. She's an assistant principal at an area high school um, down where we live. And we have one child, uh, Jacob, who's 22 years old. And when I give my son a hug, I have to look up to him. I'm a big guy. He's six foot eight. Six foot eight, Yeah. So it's uh, strange to look up to your boy and give him a hug, I'll tell you that. So he just graduated college and is a computer programmer. And uh, anyway, so it's my privilege to be here. I just want to say how much I am so thankful for Pastor Brian, for his wife, Joe Lynette, and for our friendship and for the way that they lead, not just here at City of Life, but the way that they lead myself at Southbrook and the way that they lead within the city of Milwaukee. Uh, let me tell you about a little bit about his leadership. So I pulled in this morning around 8.20 or so, the parking lot across the street. When I came in, I saw Brian outside in the parking lot. And I thought to myself, man, that's amazing. Like, he's out there waiting for me. And he was not waiting for me, okay? <laughs> he was out there picking up garbage because the barrels blew over because of the wind last night. And he was serving us before we even knew it by picking up garbage. And when I went up to him, he said, I can't even give you, I can't even shake your hand because his hands were dirty from picking up garbage. When I saw that this morning, it occurred to me, that's the type, not, not occurred to me, that's the type of leader Brian is. That's the type of leader that you have, that we have, that we are blessed to have. Someone who is willing to get in and model that way. Absolutely, 100%. And, and I'll share a little bit about his wife as well. Uh, this time last year was probably the most difficult time that my wife and I went through. Um, just a lot, absolutely, I can honestly say the most difficult time in our life. And um, man. so my wife needed someone to talk to, and she called Joe Lynette. And Joe Lynette then like came to our house and spent time listening talking, and praying with my wife. And after that, my wife said, that was the best gift that she's ever had. So when I say how thankful I am, I mean it sincerely. I mean it as transparently as possible. You know, six, seven years ago when I first met Brian and heard about City of Light and, and Southbrook was able to jump in and help support and just being able to watch how this church has grown and what God has done in this church. I was able to join you a few times in the theater and was able to worship there and to see now what is happening here with this facility and as it continues to grow with multiple services. I mean, it's just truly an honor. God is working here and God is working through Pastor Brian and Pastor Joe Lynette. And it really is my privilege to be able to come alongside under them and serve you all today by opening God's word. So I could talk all day about them, but I'm not... Um, you are honored, uh, you, you are blessed to have them as, as your pastors, really, so I just say that with all sincerity. And so knowing then that uh, Brian allowed me to speak at this opening series, this March message series called Make Us One, is that's a privilege as well. We know there's a need for unity, we know that, like you don't need another person telling you that. We know the division that exists within our city, we also know the division that exists within our churches, both urban churches and suburban churches as well. And I've seen from my perspective that there's a good chunk of suburban churches that are willing to write a check but not willing to make a friendship. And that is wrong, okay? 
At the same time, thank you, at the same time, we have, I am not used to people speaking back. I love that. Oh, my word. God bless you. We turn on our news, and on both sides of the political spectrum, we have culture warriors that are using fear to drive us away from each other. They're using fear to put barriers up between us, and we see that, and we see it time and time again. The division that is around us is the poison fruit of our brokenness. It's the poison fruit of our rebellion back to God. And so then the question is, how can we become one? And how can we become one, not just within our culture, but most importantly, how can we become one within our church and within our churches together? And that's what I want to be talking to us about this morning. This challenge to becoming one is a challenge that's existed for the past 2,000 years. And followers of Jesus have wrestled with this challenge. How do we become one? And it's caused a tremendous amount of pain and conflict, especially within our own country. When our own country was founded, anyone could be a part of a church, maybe, but those who were members had to be white male landowners. That's how unity was defined in the early parts of our country. You'd show up at a church and a pastor would wear robes, and the whole idea of wearing a robe was to separate yourself to show that you are better, that you are different than your people. Pastors gave themselves the name reverend to show that they are unlike other people around us. There wasn't a real strong desire to be one. There was a strong desire to be separate. We see in the history of our country, there's still religious groups even today that want to be separate, that don't want to be one. I think of like the Amish people who dress and act as if it's 100 and 150 years ago. Remember 10 years ago or so, my wife and I happened to be in Amish country in Pennsylvania uh, visiting some family members, and we went to a, this is a true story, we went to a local diner, and we're eating there, and we looked out the window, and we saw like a, a horse and buggy carriage pull into the parking lot, and the guy got out and tied his horse up and, and came in and sat down like right behind us, and when he sat down, like you could smell The fact that he was working outside all day. And I remember saying to my wife, I'm like, hey, that's a real Amish person right there. I mean, there's this horse in the buggy right outside the window. And as we're eating, we heard this, bloop, bloop. And I'm like, oh, what's that? Maybe it's my phone. And I checked my phone. It wasn't my phone. Checked my wife's phone. It wasn't her phone. It was the Amish dude's phone. (laughs) He was pulling out his phone and texting someone. That's a true story. I went, oh, isn't that interesting? Hypocrisy exists even in our culture and in their culture as well. Churches today don't know how to be one, and so we try to make ourselves one. We try to have unity based on things like the style of our worship or the style of how we present ourselves, and we need to make sure you know, our music is way too loud or, or we need smoke screens or we need this or we need that or, or we need to go the opposite direction and we need to be old school. We need to be hymns and choruses and piano only. And I remember being once at a pastor's conference. I went once to a pastor's conference, and I hated it. And the reason why I hate it is that every single person looked exactly the same with the boots and the hair and the tattoos and the arms and all this stuff. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things, except that there was no unit. The unity that was there was an external unity. It was you had to look a certain way, and then you were on the inside. I grew up in those types of churches. My father was a pastor, and the unity that we had in our church came from what we were against, Right? hearing those sermons about blue jeans in church or guitars being the instrument of the devil or drums or any of those types of things like that. The problem when we find our unity and what we're against is that it makes us judgmental about those people. It makes us judgmental about those churches and it makes us arrogant that we are somehow better than them because we are not like that. And I don't know about you, but sometimes like, we don't mind having those list of rules, and rules makes us feel good, but rules don't change our heart. The reality is we have a list of rules, and all we end up doing is using it to compare ourselves and say, oh, look how better I am because I'm not like you, or because I'm not like that person, and my heart is not changed towards God. The truth is a church can have a long list of rules and have no heart for God, and a church can also be unified on the wrong things, and totally miss God who's at work in their life. And that brings us to Jesus. Because Jesus had a totally different way of making us one. This morning we're going to look at a really powerful prayer that Jesus gives that speaks right to our hearts. Jesus prayed for us here today that we would become one. And we're going to look at his prayer and see how it's relevant for us today. 
So before we go any further, let's go before the Lord and let's pray. Lord, we're about to open your word. I pray, Lord, that it comes alive in our hearts, that it speaks to us, that it challenges us. Lord, if we're here today and we need conviction, then then your spirit convict us, Lord. If we need to be encouraged, then your spirit, Lord, may it encourage us. Lord, this word that we're about to open is not some ancient story. It is alive. It is powerful. It cuts to the heart. It speaks to us. Lord, I thank you for the privilege it is to serve you by serving here this morning at City of Light. Calm my nerves. Allow your truth to speak through us this morning. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. My friends, if you have a Bible, let's go ahead and turn on our Bibles. Open up our Bibles. Share with a friend to the book of John chapter 17. We're going to be in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There it is. The fourth book in the New Testament. John chapter 17. The author is a man by the name John, obviously, right? He writes as an eyewitness. He was a part of the 12 chosen followers that Jesus specifically called out. These guys were with Jesus for three years, three years of walking with him, three years of hearing him, three years of being around him, like they were in the boat when Jesus was in the boat. When uh, Jesus was healing people, they were right there. The author John now is an older man, and he's looking back on his life, and he's reflecting upon the fact that he was there, that he saw these things firsthand. And in John chapter 17, the setting of this passage is that it was the night that Jesus was about to be arrested before he is on trial, and then he's going to be hanging on the cross the early next morning. So he knows that his time is coming to an end. He knows that he's about to be crucified. As Jesus is having this final meal with his followers, he gets up from the table. He gets down on his hands and knees, and he washes their feet. After that, Judas, one of the 12 chosen ones, ones, gets up to leave to betray Jesus. And so it was 12 guys in Jesus, and now it's just 11. Then Jesus shares with these people remaining his heart. He gives them one final message before he is captured and beaten and tortured. And in this prayer that's in John chapter 17, it's a powerful prayer. It's deep and it's moving and it's rich. He talks about how we can be made one. He starts out at the very beginning of chapter 17 by praying for himself. And you can read the opening verses on your own. But Jesus is there and he's praying not for other people. He is praying for himself. And the reason why Jesus prays for himself is the same reason why we pray for ourselves. Because we need help. We need that dependence on God. We need to be in the presence of God. We need to do more than just ask God for things. We also need to listen for God speaking to us. We need to have that dependence on God. And that's why Jesus is praying for himself. And then he shifts and he starts praying for us. It's a long passage. I'm going to read John chapter 17, starting in verse 6. You can follow along. We'll read through verse 19, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Jesus is praying, and he says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Verse 9, I prayed for them, and I am not praying for the world, but for those you who have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Well, I was with them, verse 12, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled, referring to Judas. Verse 13, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is that you take them out of the world, not my prayer. Hang on, verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For 
them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. We're going to talk about this and dig into it a little bit. Jesus begins this by praying for other people, starting out in verse 6. It's what we call an intercessory prayer, to intercede on somebody else's behalf. When we pray for other people, that's what we're doing. We are taking their prayer requests and then giving them over to God. And that is exactly what Jesus is doing here. He is praying for his followers there in the room, and by extent, he's praying for us as well, taking our requests and then giving them up to God the Father. And in this prayer that he gives, he gives us three ways that we can become one. The first way is found in verse 11, when Jesus prays for our protection. Now think about this. Jesus is praying for our protection. He knows that in a few hours, he's going to be crucified. He knows in a few hours, he's going to be tortured and beaten and whipped, and he's going to have to carry the cross beam through the city. He knows that the Roman government is against him and the Jewish religious leaders are ready to kill him. He knows that evil is out there ready to destroy goodness. And yet Jesus is praying for our protection. To protect us from the culture that's around us. Protect us from the values that are around us. To even protect us from ourselves. Everything is aligned against Jesus and he knows that, but yet he's still choosing to pray for our protection. And so then the question is, how does God protect us today? Well, it's not that he keeps us from harm because Jesus himself is about to be tortured and died. I'm going to suggest this, that when Jesus is praying for our protection, he's praying, praying for us, protect us here at City of Light from losing our faith. Protect us from harming the name of Jesus. Protect us from our pride. Protect us from our arrogance that we have. Protect us from making this about us versus the name of Jesus. I will say this, in my friendship with Pastor Brian in these last five, six years that I've had a chance to be around him, that Pastor Brian and myself, like we are susceptible to pride. We are susceptible to ego. And it's true for us and it's true for our churches as well. When I think about this church and the fact that six years, seven years ago, this was an idea and spent all those years in the theater and now has been able to be here and has a, your own building and to see growth and to see multiple services and to see a, a child development center. I mean, there's so many amazing things going on here that it's easy for pride to come in. And I'm going to suggest that Jesus is praying to protect us from that. The unity that we have keeps all of those things in check. We remind ourselves as leaders that we are replaceable, that we are not needed, that if something were to happen to us, that God would bring somebody else in and then things would keep on going, which is why we make ourselves less and make God more. I'm going to challenge us here that God, I would hope that God would convict us of our pride. Once we start thinking that God needs us, Oh, then we start working for ourselves. He does not need us. He chooses to use us. And so we talk about how do we become one? How are we made one? We place ourselves under the protection of God. We keep that pride in check. We keep that arrogance in check. And Jesus is praying for us. He is praying specifically for us at City of Light that we would be protected from ourselves. The second way that we are found to be made one is at the end of verse 11. You can see it for yourself. Jesus says in his prayer, so that they may be one as we are one. And he's talking about here that if we're going to be made one, that there needs to be a unity that exists. This desire for unity is personal with Jesus. Right? It started the evening when Jesus was having this meal with 12 followers. These 12 followers have been with him for three years. That's three years of being with him firsthand, seeing him every single day. And all of a sudden, one of them has already left to betray Jesus, and that is Judas. And as soon as Jesus is done finishing this prayer, another one of those followers is going to deny Jesus three times, and that's Peter. So when Jesus here is praying for unity, there's like a real-life dimension to it, like Right now, in the next few hours, Jesus is thinking, you are going to be tested. But Jesus is also looking ahead to us. He's also looking to when we gather as a church. And the challenge is, how can we maintain unity even here today? I'm going to suggest this. 
that when it comes to being unified as a church, there are some things that are challenging for us. And one of those is our preferences. Like, there's nothing wrong with preferences. There's nothing wrong with a personal style of worship music or music that we like. We all have preferences of music. We all have preferences of our politics, of what we wear, what we want other people to wear, preferences with a hundred different things. At the church that I'm at, the worship music that we play is not my preference. Can I say that? Is that okay? I'm not saying I don't like it. I love it. Like, every Sunday... It brings me to tears in a beautiful way as I was even tearing up here singing. Like, I love it all. Like, the style of music I like, it needs to have a guitar ending being smashed and set on fire, and that's what I love. That's my preference. It's fine. We all have our preference. The challenge is we want other people to adopt our preferences, right? And in church, we allow our preferences to come out. We love to argue about our preferences with music or politics. Is it too loud, too slow, too old, too new? Hey, guess what? We have six and a half days out of the week to get our fill of our preferences. But when we come in, we set our preferences at the door, right? We leave our preferences at the parking lot, which means that City of Light needs to be way too liberal for its conservative friends, and it also needs to be way too conservative for its liberal friends coming in. One of the challenges of being unified is preferences. Another challenge that we have about being unified is that sometimes we define ourselves by what we are against versus what we are or who we are for. I've had a chance to be on staff now at our church for 22 years which means I started when I was five years old, right? Of course. Like that. And in those 22 years, man, I've gotten so many emails. We need to be preaching against Harry Potter. We need to be preaching against Pokemon. We need to preach against this movie. Preach against that. Preach against all these things. And they start listing all the things that we're supposed to be against. It's this massive circle, and there's hundreds of those things. I want to make it really clear. The unity that we have comes from the very small circle of what we are for, not what we are against. And what we are for is Jesus, the fact that he's alive, that his word is true, and I will fight to stay unified on that and not take the bait of all these other things here around us. And when Jesus says, make us one, or we talk about how do we become one, we look at this great prayer in John chapter 17. And in that prayer, Jesus says, here's how you become one, right? He prays for our protection. Protect us from ourselves, right? He prays for our unity. Like we leave our preferences at the door. We focus on what we are for, not on what we are against. There's one more way that Jesus prays for our, to make us one. And it's found in verses 17, 18, and 19. It's our, our holiness. Let me read verses 17, 18, and 19 again. Jesus says, sanctify them by by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. We see a word in there three times, sanctify. We don't really use that word a lot in our language today. We don't really talk about what does that word mean. It means to make us holy, to set us apart to make us acceptable for God's service. And how do we do that? Through the word right here. I'm a part of a men's Bible study that meets at 6 in the morning on Tuesday mornings. And last week we had 25 guys show up. 25 guys show up at 6 a.m. to study the Bible. Some of those guys have never opened a Bible in their life. Like they just come and we give them Bibles, right? They don't even know what to do. And the other day, one of those guys who's never opened a Bible in his life said, he said, I had no idea that these stories um, affect me today and are about where I'm at right now. And I said to myself, well, yeah, I mean, I don't expect someone that's never opened a Bible to understand the power of God's word. But the power of God's word is not just that it's a fascinating story. The power of God's word is that it draws you closer to Jesus and it makes you more like him. The power of God's word is that it changes your heart. And why that's so important for us is that I don't want you to listen. Now, listen to what I'm going to say. I don't want you to listen to Pastor Brian's opinions because they're just his opinions. And our opinions can be wrong. Like, I know I can lead myself astray. And if I can lead myself astray, then certainly I can lead those in my church astray. 
The challenge is not to listen to our opinions. The, pal- the challenge is to open up God's word and to dig into God's word and see what God has to say for himself. Which is why when we come to City of Light, we bring our Bibles, digital or paper, it doesn't matter. We just open and we dig into God's word. We want God's word to infuse us. I love the fact that at this church, there's an emphasis on small groups. I'm just going to say that. Like, I was on your website. I saw you have groups that meet in person. You have groups that meet online. Like, it doesn't matter what venue of group, but to encourage you to get into a group, a chance to get around God's word with other people that you can learn and discuss and figure out what does this mean. And that's how we become holy. That's how we become more like Jesus. At City of Light, our holiness means that we are being drawn closer and closer to Jesus. Our holiness is not measured in externals. Those things just make us smug and arrogant, make us better than other people, or we think better than other people. At City of Light, our holiness drives us to serve the least of these. That's how we know we are becoming holy. Our holiness drives us to care for those who are overlooked. It gives us a passion to show unconditional love to other people. Our holiness is not about how spiritual we are, but it's found in our desire to care for other people. Our holiness drives us into our communities. It causes us to love our immigrant neighbors. It causes us to care for those people with unplanned pregnancy. It causes us to run into the chaos around us. Our holiness drives us to serve meals and to friend and sacrifice other people. It was a couple years ago when City of Light rolled out its Amplify campaign. I remember seeing it and being amazed as I watched the video of what Amplify meant. I remember talking with my wife and I said, we, like, we have to get involved in this. We have to support this. We have to financially invest in this because it's all about um, uh, seeing this building not as the goal, but as a means to help us accomplish the goal, right? It's allowing this building not to be the end but just to be a tool to help us reach more and more people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And when we saw that, we said that we have to be involved in that. I am so thankful to be able to see what is happening here. The holiness that God gives us causes us to put God first, other people second, and then ourselves third. It's not about keeping a long list of rules, because all those rules do is make us arrogant, and they don't change the heart, and God is always looking for the heart. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, right, he knows he's going to be heading to the cross. He prays specifically for us. He prays for us. He prays for City of Light Church, for Southbrook Church, for anyone who is a follower of Jesus. He prayed to make us one, and we do it through his protection. Protect us from our pride. Protect us from our arrogance. Protect us from our self-sufficiency, depending on ourselves. He prayed for our unity. We find unity by leaving our preferences at the door when we come in here. We focus on what we are for versus what we are against. He prayed for our holiness. What matters to God is not the long list of rules that we can keep, but that our hearts are set for him. Our holiness drives us to care for other people. I just want to encourage you, encourage all my friends here at City of Light. As Brian mentioned, this is a wonderful opportunity to get involved in serving, right? We want to be uh, in a group to grow and a place to serve. That's the language that we use. And I just want to encourage you as well. This is how we can become more and more like Jesus. Like healthy people grow. I just want to encourage you to find that place to grow, find that place to serve, and find that small group to get involved in. Would you now join me in prayer? Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you for a beautiful day of worshiping you. Lord, the reality is like every day belongs to you. It's not that we just give you Sunday, Lord. You get every day. You get every moment that we have. You get every breath that's in our lungs. It's all yours. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to grow City of Light in ways that are honoring and pleasing to you. That you watch over the leadership of this church. That you hold Pastor Brian and Joe Lynette close to your heart, Lord. That you protect their family, that you watch over their children, that you protect the rest of the staff and the volunteers that come and faithfully serve, that you grow this church, Lord, and that would truly be a light in the darkness for you. Lord, we are so thankful that your desire is that we would become one, and so we place ourselves under your protection. 
We work, Lord, at being unified with each other. And Lord, help us to be holy. Help us to be transformed into the image of your son, Jesus. And it's in his powerful and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Let's thank God for Pastor Jonathan. Make us one. Make us one. Listen, it's important for us to understand that, especially during this time in our country and actually around the world, that we need a message that unifies and not divides. As Pastor Jonathan said, there are too many people that are focused on what they are against and not what we are for together. And when we established City of Light Church by the power and the direction of God, we said that we were going to look at what are the things that we are for, for people from different backgrounds, ethnic group and cultural group, what are the things that we are for under Christ? And God has been blessing us to go out and do this work of unifying in our community. So I wanna invite you as uh, this series goes on, who are the people that could benefit from this series that you know and be evangelistic? Can I see your hand if you're gonna be evangelistic? Be evangelistic and say, who are the people that, we, that I know that can benefit from understanding the power of unity. God blesses unity. Look, when we get to heaven, it's not gonna be all one color. It's not gonna be all one background, right? And I believe that we can experience some heaven right here on earth. Amen. So let's stand as we prepare to dismiss. Now bless us. Father, I thank you for this word. Thank you for Pastor Jonathan. I pray that you would bless Southbrook Church and even as their leader has such a heart to serve, and you see it in their congregation. I pray, Father, for unity, not only of pastors and congregations, but those that have been so siloed in this segregated area. I believe and I declare that years from now, that Milwaukee and the surrounding suburbs will no longer be the most segregated area in the United States. Declare it right now. And I believe, God, that by your power that you can do it. And we say yes to you and we yield to you. We open up our hearts, Father, and we lay our preferences down, God. Fill us with your spirit and lead us in the way that Jesus is already moving. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you all. See you all next week. See you all at small groups this week. If you're new, Welcome Center is out there. We have a free gift for you.